York. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon will host the summit. I will convene a climate summit for leaders at the highest level. I urge political leaders of the world uh, to prioritize their political energy on climate change. We have to get serious about bringing real commitments to the table for that summit. If things go business as usual, we will not live, we will die. On September 23rd, the United Nations is holding a historic climate summit where they've invited world leaders and heads of state from around the world. We're trying to organize the largest ever climate rally on the streets of New York in response to this, hopefully turning the tide of what comes out of that summit and reshaping what the entire climate movement looks like going forward. Climate tipping points are scary, but if we stay connected to each other, we can build the largest climate mobilization in history. We all have power to create the movement tipping point on climate change, the one that takes our leaders from this place of inaction and puts them on a journey towards saving the planet. All of the big social movements in history have had people in the streets women's voting rights, civil rights movement, and even more recently on climate issues, our big successes have happened when people left their homes and went out into the streets. This is a bigger fight than, in fact, has ever been won. It's not that we need to save the Earth. We need to save the systems that make the Earth compatible with human existence and the existence of other life forms. This is the fight of our time, but none of us should exactly have to be activists about all this. In a rational world, the fact that scientists had said, the worst thing on Earth is happening now, and here's what you can do to stop it, that would have been enough to push our systems into action. Yeah, of all the things that probably get me most upset, it's when people start presenting climate change as if it's something new. The science behind our understanding of man-made climate change is very, very old and very well established. So the task we've taken on is documenting this history to help us understand where we are, how we got here, and how we can change course. Scientists have known for more than 150 years that carbon dioxide was a greenhouse gas. Fourier came up with this notion that there were gases in our atmosphere that allowed sunlight to pass through like a window, but then when sunlight bounced off the Earth's surface, they trapped the heat in, right? So you had now this establishment of what we now call the greenhouse effect. In the 1850s, John Tyndall made laboratory measurements of the absorption of heat radiation by carbon dioxide. And he concluded that if you change the CO2 in the atmosphere, it's going to affect the planetary energy balance. Tyndall was the one who really came along and proved that carbon dioxide was a natural thermostat that helped set our planet's temperature. In the late 1800s, it was the great Swedish chemist Arrhenius who first did the calculations about what would happen as we, as he put it, evaporated our coal mines into the air. But people didn't pay much attention to that in the 20th century because we were too busy figuring out cool new ways to burn fossil fuel. It was only in the late 1950s that we even bothered to measure to see if it was accumulating in the atmosphere. That instrument, which went up on the side of Mauna Loa in Hawaii, is the most important scientific instrument in the world. Beginning in 1959, it found that there was a steadily accumulating amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, the so-called Keeling Curve. The Keeling Curve is one of the most important pieces of scientific work of the 20th century that shows us that carbon dioxide has been rising, 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 continuously and systematically since the Industrial Revolution. Keeling didn't just show that there was an increase in carbon dioxide, he also pinpointed the source. And what Keeling showed so incredibly was that roughly one out of every four CO2 molecules in our atmosphere today they were put there by us. 
Just a year ago, we passed uh, 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, the pre-industrial level was about 280 parts per million. So human society in the industrial era has raised the level of CO2 in the atmosphere by about 40%. And many people fear that before we're done, we're gonna double it or even triple it. We're pumping CO2 into the atmosphere at a speed which we have never seen before in modern human history. We are absolutely racing into uncharted territory. In our lifetime, human beings left behind the Holocene, this 10,000 year period, benign climatic stability that coincides with the rise of human civilization. We have crossed a great threshold and we stand on the edge of others. I remember when the Weather Channel was this kind of like nice, sleepy little station. Now it's like a horror show. The climate is being disrupted. That's not for next year or a thousand years from now. That's happening right now. What all climate scientists will agree on is that the entire atmosphere has changed. All the atmospheric dynamics have changed. So every event that happens now is in the context of climate change. It's different from how it would have been. Typhoon slammed into the Philippines with winds of 195 miles per hour. That's higher than the winds from Hurricane Sandy and Katrina combined. The world is mobilizing to help the Philippines, but just a trickle of food and water and medicine has reached the victims of Typhoon Haiyan. More than a million people were forced to flee their homes, many now trying to salvage what's left. Hundreds of thousands are thronging relief centers, desperate for life's necessities. Many residents covered their faces to mask the smell of the dead while they searched for relatives in some of the hardest hit areas. This is one of the top storms ever seen on this planet. Mr. President, Your Excellency, what my country is going through as a result of this extreme climate event is madness. Super Typhoon Haiyan made landfall in my own family's hometown. And the devastation is staggering. I struggle to find words to describe how I feel about the losses. To anyone outside who continues to deny and ignore the reality that is climate change, I dare them I dare them to get off their ivory towers and away from the comfort of their armchairs. I dare them to go to the islands of the Pacific. We refuse as a nation to accept a future where super typhoons like Haiyan become a way of life. We refuse to accept that running away from storms, evacuating our families, counting our dead become a way of life. We simply refuse to. We can fix this. We can stop this madness. Hello, hello, hello. All right, folks, we know why we're here. We have 80 days starting tomorrow to pull off the largest climate march in history. It's really important for folks to remember that although climate change affects everyone, the impacts are not evenly distributed. And we're asking each one of these breakout groups, prioritize people of color, folks, because this is real, it's disproportionate, and it's time to bring it. They need to act on a binding global agreement to reduce greenhouse gases. We can do that and create jobs at the same time. Part of what we're doing is moving people from fossil fuels to the solutions and also presenting them with economic opportunities around the solution. The idea of who's going to be leading this march are the people in this room. This environmental issue is the singular issue of our time, of our day, that will determine how we live, where we live, and if we live. 
The most important tool that we have is our people power. There are already 325 groups and that list is gonna grow every single day. Whatever you're thinking about doing to help build this mobilization, rethink it and make it bigger, make it bolder. Our job is to make sure everybody hears about it and then they'll get there. They'll get there, that's our job. In 1982, the UN convened a first uh, special session on nuclear disarmament. And we came together and said, when the representatives of governments all around the world gather in New York City at the UN, we need to be on the streets making our voice heard. New York City's anti-nuclear demonstration turned out to be the biggest political demonstration in US history. It was, and still to this date, is the largest single gathering, if you will, uh, of people in this country. I think there was one computer in the office. Everything else was by phone and this thing we called the mail. We now call it snail mail or whatever. But there was something about that reality that we didn't have, the technology that we now have, that actually forced people to talk directly to each other. We have real people. One of the really interesting things about that demonstration is that some 600 local groups were formed, and many of those groups lasted for years afterwards. To me, the real power of that day was the organizing experience that led up to it, and then the organizing that came out of it. Some experts are saying now that the whole world is heating up because of a global greenhouse effect. Scientists had been saying for a long time that climate change might occur, but 1988 is the year when Jim Hansen and his team at NASA say, both in the scientific peer-reviewed literature and in public, that it's actually happening. The changes in atmospheric composition that humans were making was going to have a big impact on the Earth's climate. The greenhouse effect has been detected and it is changing our climate now. Hansen's testimony was reported on the front page of the New York Times, and there was actually a bill introduced into Congress, the National Energy Policy Act, to immediately begin to phase out the use of fossil fuels in order to prevent disruptive climate change. And of course, that was supported by the creation of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that year. So there was political momentum, there was scientific momentum, there was strong scientific evidence, there was media attention, and then the whole thing kind of fell apart. The Earth Summit, a 12-day, 178-nation conference on the environment, began today in Rio de Janeiro. Battle lines are already drawn between the haves and the have-nots. So far, all the agreements are non-binding, requiring no specific action on the environment. As time has gone on, the scientific warnings keep intensifying, and yet there has been no effective political response. All political efforts to get a handle on this issue have essentially failed. I am the one that is burdened with finding the balance between sound environmental practice on the one hand and jobs for American families on the other. The agreement hammered out in Kyoto, Japan, requires industrialized nations to make substantial cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. The United States actually never ratified the Kyoto Protocol, which is one reason it didn't work. President Bush ignited a storm of controversy when he decided to abandon the Kyoto Protocol, which sets caps on the emissions of greenhouse gases in developed nations. For nearly two weeks, the U.S. delegation had blocked proposal after proposal, draft after draft, refusing to even discuss mandatory cuts in greenhouse emissions. Now we switch to the big climate conference going on in Copenhagen. Today, developing countries made themselves heard. People are dying. Led by Africa, 135 nations, including India and China, staged a five-hour boycott. Angry over what they say are insufficient carbon cuts proposed by the world's rich countries. If Hollywood had been writing the story, you know, it all would have come right in the end, and all the nations would have pledged their best effort. And nothing like that happened. The thing was a fiasco. 
fiasco, a failure. The frustrations of the last 10 days explode on the streets of Copenhagen. Outside the Bella Center, where negotiators still haven't reached a climate agreement, 2,500 protesters try to storm the hall to make an impact. Nothing happened because the fossil fuel industry was still strong enough to scare nations into avoiding the issue. What happened in Copenhagen for a lot of people was this realization no leader was coming to save us. We have to be strong enough to scare our national leaders into doing the right thing in New York City in September. If we can demonstrate that, then better things will happen in Paris than happened in Copenhagen. These things are not separate moments in time. This is all part of one string, and what we're fighting towards in Paris is highly dependent on what happens in September. This is going to have to be the fight of our lives. Welcome to this press conference to present the report of IPCC Working Group 3 on mitigation of climate change. If we really want to bring about a limitation of temperature increase to no more than 2 degrees Celsius, there is then the need for an unprecedented level of international cooperation. The way we've approached climate change is the scientific community builds the case, it synthesizes the evidence, it presents that evidence then to the policymakers. We've proven beyond a doubt that climate change is real, that the Earth's temperature is warming, that that warming is, is predominantly caused by the burning of fossil fuels and other human activities, and that that additional warming poses a significant threat. What the policymaking community did was they came up with a definition of what they called dangerous human interference. In 2009, the nations of the world agreed on a target of 2 degrees centigrade or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit of maximum warming above the pre-industrial level. That would require emissions worldwide almost entirely stopping within a matter of decades. A lot of people talk about two degrees being the safe level. Well, there is no safe level. Two degrees is a round number that would be safer, but we'll still have substantial climate impacts. One degree is melting the Arctic and the Antarctic. We'd be crazy to find out what two degrees will do, but we're probably gonna find out. Even if we do everything right at this point, that's about as good an outcome as we can hope for. The other thing that the IPCC did was that they tied that 2 degrees Celsius, 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit threshold to the amount of fossil fuels that we can actually burn. And they came up with this red line in the sand, which was a trillion tons of carbon. The problem is that we're already more than halfway there. We're approaching 600 million tons already. And at the rate things are going, we will have completely exhausted that carbon budget within 30 years. The same leaders who say they want the temperature to go up no more than two degrees have put forward a series of proposals that when you add them up leads to the temperature rising six degrees. A point past which most sane scientists think civilization on the scale that we now know it will not be possible. It's almost a kind of refusal to come to grips with reality. There's just this enormous gap between what countries say they want to do and what they're actually on track to do. People call this the emissions gap. Much of this is about mathematics. You gotta leave 80% fossil fuel in the ground. Fossil fuel industry wants to burn all its reserves. If they do, then we get that six degrees. Each day of inaction, each day of business as usual, puts us closer and closer on this crash course. We are, we're two months out from this mm -hmm. demo. And um, obviously, we all know in this room, a tremendous amount of work has happened, is happening every day, getting the word out, organizing people, mobilizing people. At this point, every day counts. And every day when we miss an opportunity, it's gone. Because it's not just a one-day march, it's our long-term ability to build a strong climate movement that we need to invest in. So being inclusive to us is really uh, about multiple things, but recognizing that we live in a society where there's privilege, there are in inequities. And in order to address the climate crisis, we have to first address those inequities. That will allow us to then bring a movement strong enough to address the global ecological crisis. 
if you think for a second about this, there was this just layer of stuff under the ground, got put there at a specific time in a specific way, and it just captured millennia of solar energy. And we just happened upon it. It's like if you were just walking around and then like, oh, you put something in the ground, there's just millions of dollar bills down there. You're just like pulling them out. Everything about what we do and who we are and how we live is dependent upon the fact that we just found this stuff sitting there. And that stuff said, oh, you don't have to have everyone working in the fields all the time. <laughs> you can have cities, you can have cars, you can have iPhones. And the way I view it is, as incredible as that stuff is, we've been paying this price on it the whole time, <laughs> right? And there's this clock running. The classic market failure is negative environmental externalities. That's just jargon for you're not paying the full costs of the fossil fuels that you burn. The racket that the fossil fuel industry has run is to take costs of its product and export them to the public. Think about you know, the, the litany of impacts from sea level rise, ocean acidification, the collapse of ecosystems that we rely on for food, water availability. These things are really expensive. When you have huge wildfires, it costs a lot of money. All of those costs are being dumped onto us as a society and not being paid by people who are polluting. These big, massive polluters get to dump megatons of carbon in the atmosphere for free. You can't pollute for free. If you litter, you get a fine. That makes coal and oil and other fossil fuels more competitive against solar and wind and other sources than they deserve to be. Behind the environmental problems that carbon pollution causes and behind the economic problems is a political problem that a very small group of very powerful special interests have exerted very rough control over the political establishment. We're up against the fossil fuel lobby that has complete access to the political class and the ability to bribe through legal means and blackmail through the use of attack ads and so on. Even people who oppose them have trouble opposing them too strongly because they're in some ways economically dependent on them. Right now we have a monopoly control by big carbon polluters. They grant themselves subsidy after subsidy. Think about this. How much money does the Pentagon spend helping big private oil companies get their for-profit products from the Middle East here? About half the Pentagon's budget is just helping Chevron and, and Shell and Exxon get their for-profit product here. What if they had to pay for that service? How much would gas cost then? Plus, they also get all kind of tax breaks and other kind of loopholes. They're in a system based on a grow or die ethic. But rather than respond to the climate crisis by scaling back, they're doubling down through fracking, through tar sands oil, through coal exports, mountaintop removal. They have become more brazen. It's a rogue industry. It's an industry if whose business plan is followed to the letter will wreck the planet. Once you know that, then you know that these are now illegitimate business plans. We have to figure out how to disassociate ourselves with them. That is beginning to happen all over the world. On the Great Lawn of Central Park, I was up on a stage probably 70 feet in the air looking out at that sea of people stretching out farther than the eye could see. The crowd estimates later were larger than a million people. April 22, 1970. The grassroots mobilization, which we recall as the first Earth Day, 20 million Americans called away from their jobs and their classes into the streets of their communities. When Nixon was looking at television, at these huge crowds in city after city after city across the country, he apparently muttered to Ehrlichman, man, a lot of those people have got to be Republican. And Republicans needed him to do something for them on this issue, he felt, and it was Nixon, arguably one of the most anti-environmental presidents in American history, who felt compelled to sign the Clean Air Act. I, I think the things that we've been doing to date are a reason to give us a, a little bit of hope. We've seen a degree of responsiveness on the part of now of the 
House of Representatives and on the part of the U.S. Senate. In a matter of three years, we passed the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, National Environmental Policy Act, uh, the Environmental Education Act, it, 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 the Superfund. I'd go so far as to say that with the possible exception of the New Deal, it was the most fundamental restructuring of the ground rules of the American economic system that the nation has experienced. Folks, we are 50 days away from the largest climate march in history. Are y'all ready? Yeah! This is not just about the environment. It's about the community. It's about public health. It's about jobs. It's about justice. It was labor that got this city yes. up and moving. Yes. Yes. And it'll be labor that continues to move this city. We are the community. Are we not the community? Yeah. For our people, our people who have been at the front line, not being able to breathe, suffering from asthma, upper respiratory, pulmonary disease, cancer clusters because of environmental racism. Climate change exacerbates every kind of social injustice that faith communities have fought against for thousands of years. And we will not stop marching and praying and acting until we have a strong climate treaty. We got a movement, brothers and sisters, and we got to stay together. So Amen. join us on the 21st to march and send that signal to the United Nations. The people united will never be defeated. The people unido, a must and vencido. It's only by accident that we even think of climate change as an environmental issue. You could just as easily think of it as another example of what happens in an unequal society. The people who've contributed the least to climate change and who benefited the least from the use of fossil fuel are the first people to feel the effects. People in the poorest parts of the world suffer enormously already and will suffer enormously more as the century wears on. Climate disruption is a social justice issue. Who gets hit first and worst? Every time there's one of these weather disasters, it's low-income people, it's people of color, it's people who can't get out of harm's way, and people who can't bounce back easily because they don't have the money or the social standing or the political connections. Our communities are disproportionately impacted. We're all seeing that it's the indigenous people, the people of color, the low-income people who have historically suffered the burden of so many other politically driven crises. There are so many countries that have been systematically plundered over hundreds of years. And this is often described as an ecological debt, climate debt. The whole idea that there are disposable places was always a racist idea. The idea of sacrifice zones, just treating people in places like garbage. The place where it's hardest for it to sink in is in the suburban United States. We're insulated against the natural world. That's what the suburbs really are, a way of making you not notice the natural world very much. And we're insulated in those places by wealth. At least we think we are. Scientists are screaming from the rooftops about us avoiding going over a two degree rise in the temperature of the planet. Why are they so worried about that? If we go over that amount of warming, there are feedback loops in our ecosystems, tipping points that climate change could spin out of control. And it happens like that. There are switches that can be tripped where suddenly you are in brand new territory and you don't even begin to know what to do about it. This is not a linear kind of problem that we're dealing with. This is very much an exponential kind of problem. Right now, we're on the edge of three major tipping points. The first one is the Arctic ice cap. That ice cap's like a mirror. It reflects the sun's light off of the Earth and, and keeps it from warming us up. But as it melts, you get a smaller mirror, which means a warmer Earth, which means more melting, which means more climate change. Another example is Arctic methane. We've got a gigantic amount of methane gas frozen into the tundra. 
and it is 50 times as toxic as CO2 is. It's CO2 on steroids. As it warms, and that methane gets released, it then causes global warming to get worse, which means it warms more, which means more methane released, which means worse warming, and all of that process spins out of control. Another example of a tipping point is ocean acidification. As you get more CO2 in the atmosphere, a lot of it actually is going into our oceans. And a lot of stuff, like plankton, can't live in that kind of acidified water. And plankton is the basis of the food chain. If the plankton die, we lose the whole ocean ecosystem. These kinds of feedback loops and tipping points are what keep me up at night, that we will hit one before we're able to turn things around. Even if we went cold turkey today because of the time lags in our climate system, we've already signed up for things that we can't see yet. We live in a razor thin livable universe. Just a few kilometers below my feet, it's too hot to live. Just a few kilometers above my head, the air is too thin to breathe. It's not about a few more droughts and a few more storms. It's about a catastrophic shift in this fragile balance of our biosphere that threatens everything we love. What we all need to be focused on is turn out, turn out, turn out. Youth, is there somebody that wants to do an update from youth, Armando? Uh, it's just a quick list of things I wanted to go over. Obviously, a lot of uh, the folks who are working on the youth stuff are at the uh, Climate Justice Youth Leadership Summit. There's a lot of organizing going on right now. Uh, there for the People's Climate March, so a lot of people who may not have been plugged in already uh, are getting informed about it, and the people who already are informed about it are getting even more people fired up about it. There's a lot of things that we pay attention to, that we focus on, that are fun, but they are short-lived and they are not for the betterment of us. We have to reprioritize what's important to us. Our environment isn't just ice caps melting in Antarctica. We're the ones who face the problems day to day. If you're breathing in smog or your little brother has asthma, that's environmental injustice. And those are things that we have the power to push back on. Imagine being the person who changes the face of climate change so that we don't have to deal with those impacts every day. So if September 21st, we're gonna march for climate justice. So who's with us? Come on. Okay, all right. Yes, yes, we, we pulled the fossil fuels out of the ground, we put them in the incinerator, they put the carbon in the sky, it warms the earth, lots of bad stuff's gonna happen, heat waves, extreme weather, floods. Okay, sure. But I mean, really, is that the thing I care about most? You know, there's all these other issues in my life that are more pressing. For someone who is engaged in a struggle for a higher minimum wage or worries about healthcare, it's understandable that these molecules floating around the air seem invisible and abstract. Humans have this thing that we call a finite pool of worry. You've got your mortgage you've got to pay, you've got your kids you've got to take care of, and they tend to be more immediate. We respond to things that feel incredibly urgent, like a gun to the head, a stampede of wild elephants, right? Climate change is a completely different kind of risk. It plays out over these very long time scales. It's really hard to perceive it as a very urgent threat. The other thing that happens is that there's something called a single action bias. We have this tendency to see a threat and then we try to fix it with one thing. It's like the silver bullet solution. When we look at climate change, we become overwhelmed by it because there's so many different ways that we're gonna need to fix it. 25 years we've been talking about climate change. The level of scientific reports becomes higher and higher and higher. Why has that still not compelled the majority of people to action. Cognitive psychologists have been mapping the processing systems within our brains, and they found that there are two parallel and deeply interlocked processing systems. The rational side, the analytic side, which deals with information, facts, data, 
we have another side, which is a much more intuitive and emotionally driven side. It is that emotional system that moves us into action. The challenge for climate change is how do we get something that is so based in the science to cross over into the side which makes us feel something. People are reluctant to stand up and to take action if they don't see that the other people around them are taking action. And that is why it's absolutely critical that there are people who are seen to be doing something. They are creating the breakage. Climate change is strangely, maybe uniquely problematic because not only are we all bystanders, we're also perpetrators actively contributing to the thing. If we recognize the problem, we become morally compelled to take action on it. There is a fundamental tipping point at which that has to happen. Change doesn't happen because people decide to stay home and click like on Facebook. Change happens because people like you and I decide to get involved. We didn't want to leave it to world leaders. Their track record is not very good in dealing with this question. I am a trade unionist, and I am an environmentalist, and I see no conflict whatsoever in those two things. It's in our core self-interest as a trade union movement to help build the path to a sustainable future and get on the right side of the climate change issue sooner rather than later. Normally it takes a long time to switch energy sources, you know, 50, 60 years to go from wood to coal, coal to oil and gas. We lack 50, 60 years. The reason we want to get off of fossil fuels now is because we have to, to protect our way of life. We need a vision for what the post-carbon economy looks like that is inspiring enough and delivers enough in terms of jobs, in terms of new opportunities, in terms of better health. It has to be exciting. There are many more jobs available to people who are gonna be building wind turbines, retrofitting houses so they waste less energy. Solar panels have to be installed by a person. That person has to go to your home. There's no way to outsource putting that solar panel onto a roof. A 100% renewable economy is within our grasp. It's economically and technologically possible. It's not something that we need to keep researching, keep researching, because it's always off in the distance. No, it's here. It's a question of political will. If you look at the renewable revolution that's happened in Germany, it wasn't about leaving the renewable sector to the market. It was about creating different incentives. And there was an explosion of innovation and creativity. Germany is now the number one solar country in the world, even though they have the same amount of solar incidents as Alaska. Can we do it? Can we take the power that has been highly centralized and highly focused and controlled by very few hands, and it is not an accident that very few hands controlling power in the sense of electricity leads to very few hands controlling power in the sense of political power. We are going to try a global experiment that is going to be the most difficult thing human beings have ever done, which is to rip those two apart, which means we are democratizing power in both senses of the word. The real question is, are we gonna scrape the bottom of the barrel for the last polycarbons on Earth to burn them too? Or can we actually show some restraint, which we ask our children to do, don't eat the last 17 marshmallows, can you just show some restraint and choose a wiser course? A Canadian company called TransCanada wants to build the Keystone XL pipeline. The $13 billion system would carry crude oil from the so-called tar sands region in Alberta to Houston, Texas for refining. The Keystone XL pipeline has become a huge focus of controversy. The tar sands oil is particularly dirty, it's particularly carbon intensive. An estimated 2,000 environmental activists from across the continent plan to gather in Washington, D.C. to launch a two-week protest. It has become a symbol 
to both sides in this debate where the people who want further development of fossil fuels see getting Keystone through as core to their strategy, and on the other side, the climate activists see it as a symbolic fight that they have to win. I am here as a Nebraska citizen and landowner. I am on the advisory board of the Center for Health and the Global Environment at Harvard Medical School. I'm an Medical evangelical school. Christian. I'm a proud member of the Transport Workers Union of America. You know what's so fascinating about this whole Keystone thing is that that was supposed to be a wedge and instead it's been turned upside down. Now it's actually a base <laughs> that is lining up constituency after constituency. Today we act! Today we send a message to them and everybody else. We are taking back our futures! Something extraordinary and unexpected has backfired out of the ambition of the fossil fuel companies. They've built a movement by mistake. If you are gonna be risking arrest, you're gonna be lining up over here. One of the tools that came into play was peaceful civil disobedience to show the moral urgency of these problems, that this was the crisis of our time. I saw a story in one of the trade publications, the oil industry, not long ago, and they said, we're never gonna to get to build another pipeline in peace again and I hope they're right. As scientists, we study this out of this fascination and kind of awe of this whole system that, that we call home. We are on this planet that is so perfectly built to sustain life. We got so lucky. And then you begin to think, what do you do with this knowledge, this unbearable, incredibly depressing knowledge that the decision to burn fossil fuels was a decision that had tremendous downside risks that we didn't realize immediately. When I read a climate science article that talks about mid-century projections, what I read is what's gonna happen when my kid is 40. That's what I see on the page. And for me, it is absolutely my responsibility then to do whatever it takes to protect my child. Alice Walker says that resistance is the secret of joy. And I don't know if it's the secret of joy, but I know it is definitely the secret of staving off depression. <laughs> The reality we're facing is very grave. So how do you not get depressed about it? Well, one way you don't get depressed is by work. Things change for lots of different reasons. There's all kinds of dynamics, but one central element is people being in the streets. All of us must stand up together and say, no more. We live in a culture that doesn't tell us our own history, doesn't tell us the history of social movement wins. And the times in our past when masses of people have taken the wheel of history and turned it. It was only 1% of Americans that ever took part in a civil rights demonstration, but they were able to change our society enough to stand up to those powers that be. I think this march will go down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, demonstrations for freedom and human dignity ever held in the United States. Martin Luther King always said that the victories that had been won so far were the ones that were cheapest to the status quo. Giving legal rights and giving voting rights doesn't cost the system nearly as much as providing good jobs and good infrastructure and good schools. We as a people will get to the promised land. Big victories have been won before, but nothing on the scale of the economic challenge that really responding to the climate crisis represents. We have a responsibility to rise to our historical moment. We are joining around the world to say the time has come. If we're going to have a movement worthy of the name, solidarity among all these different causes needs to be the foremost principle. It's this broad and powerful spectrum of allies that has the political weight to move the dial on this. There's a tipping point coming where the online movements are going to move offline. If we can just push this to a point where there is a social tipping point, we really can move forward on this issue. No, we will not be stopped. Take action right now. This is the issue I will vote on. This is the issue I will give money on. This is the issue that I will scream at the top of my lungs into a bullhorn over. That is what moves politics. The People's Climate March is our chance to 
show the immense power of people in solidarity. Heads of state are gathering. They need us to say, we demand action. This is the right thing at the right time in the right place. The whole world will be watching. Nothing moves public opinion more than seeing large numbers of people gathering. A march is not an end in itself. It is a tool. In my heart of hearts, I know that this People's Climate March in September will serve to deepen this movement. I will be there in New York, September 21st. There is no replacement, even in the digital age, for human bodies next to each other, standing as one, hearts beating as one, voices raised as one, making a political demand. If you don't fight for what you want, you deserve what you get. September 21st, in some ways, is the beginning. There are teams around the world organizing marches in Rio, in Delhi, in Berlin, in Paris, in London. And people around the world will get together in the largest climate change mobilization in history. Are you ready to march?